Happy New Year, everyone. Thomas Brinsko, publisher of Bic Magazine and BicMagazine.com. A few weeks ago, I spoke to you about uh, the rebellion against ESG and green energy policy. In particular, we discussed how the benefits of hydrocarbons are never factored into the cost-benefit analysis used by those who wish to end their use. Today, I want to discuss how the United States is already doing more than its share, and no matter how much we do, it won't matter if Eastern countries like China and India don't join in the effort. Last month, at the Global Environmental Conference, COP28, there was a renewables pledge signed by 123 countries, including the United States. That pledge said it would propel a global movement toward energy systems that are free of unabated fossil fuels, and it wants to do it by mid-century at the latest. By unabated fuels, fossil fuels, they mean fossil fuels without CO2 capture. These countries in the same pledge have committed to work together to triple the world's green energy capacity by 2030. There are three major challenges here. First, nothing in this pledge is enforceable, so it probably won't happen. My prediction is no matter how much cash the United States throws at this, we and certainly the group of 123 nations will ever reach this goal of tripling wind and solar capacity in the next six years. Countries are always going to look after their own economic well-being well before ever taking painful steps to reach fuzzy CO2 global goals. Even the countries that earnestly want to do it face huge supply chain problems, land use issues, and permitting challenges. The second point is that even if these 123 countries are able to meet this renewables goal, it won't be a game changer in hydrocarbon use. Wind and solar still account for less than 4% of all humanity's energy consumption. Achieving net zero in 2050 by increasing renewables, a little more than wishful thinking. There's a group out there called the Global Carbon Project. They recently estimated that worldwide CO2 emissions from burning fossil fuels are going to increase this year by 1.1%. This represents a pretty good slowdown from the last two decades, but the same report said emissions would have to drop by 9% annually to achieve the Paris Climate Agreement's goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Which brings me to my third point. Notably absent from the signatory parties to that agreement were China and India. American fossil fuel producers reduced our emissions in 2023 through a variety of means, including being a world leader in carbon capture. The big problem is that in China, emissions are set to rise by twice as much as the U.S. decline. And India is growing fast also. The Western world's emission production won't matter as long as China and India continue to build more plants. And last year, China approved 106 gigawatts of coal power, four times as much as they had in 2021, and more than the United States has in total. Cheap fossil fuel has always helped build economies and help people flourish. Since 1980, India has increased their fossil fuel use by 700%, and China over 600%. And during that time frame, India's life expectancy increased by 17 years, and China's by 14 years. The EIA declared last month the world is witnessing, quote, the beginning of the end of the fossil fuel era. I disagree. Why should we hamstring our economy by using unproven means in pursuit of unreachable goals, while China and India grow into economic powers, potentially surpassing the United States by burning more and more coal, oil, and natural gas? For solar and wind, the intrinsic problem is unreliability. They can go to zero at any time. There's no grid in the world even near 50% solar and wind powered without it having reliance on neighboring grids as backup. And those neighboring grids are using uh, hydrocarbons, of course. Very recently, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation released its long-term assessment for reliability. It said rising peak demand and the planned retirement of 83 gigawatts of fossil fuel generation over the next 10 years creates huge blackout risks for most of the United States. We can't be a superpower if we're facing power blackouts on a regular basis. We've seen it locally just in the last few years. It's only going to get worse if we retire these uh, fossil fueled plants. The world needs far more energy 
So there's no reason to expect lower demand for any form of cost-effective energy. And fossil fuels are cost-effective and ultra-versatile. We need energy freedom policies. And to stop this foolish notion that we're ever going to replace hydrocarbons, that is until there's a ginormous technology breakthrough. And that's not going to happen by having a bunch of nations sign a pledge. If you're not following us already on LinkedIn and Twitter, please do. And I'll see you soon.